Welcome to The Connecting Point. I'm reminded of the passage of Scripture where Jesus was with his disciples. He was taken up in front of them. And the angel says, why stand gazing, you men of Galilee? The same Jesus that went away will come again in like manner. Are you ready for that? I am. I am. Boy, what a great song. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalm. Psalm 63. I don't know if you've ever been in a desert place. Now, not a literal desert place, I guess. Some of you may have. Um, you know how barren a desert is? You know how dry a desert is? Well, <laughs> we're kind of going through that right now, aren't we? In our, and, you know, I was watching the weather the other day. And um, not watching the weather, but watching some people talk about the weather. And um, they were talking about us being in a drought. And this could be one of the worst droughts in years that we've been through. Um, wouldn't you agree with that spiritually? Our nation is in a drought. And uh, in Psalm 63, I just, as I was, as I was studying this this week, what a, what a, what a great passage of Scripture. Um, I love the psalm. And i um, been challenged by a, friend, a pastor friend of mine to uh, pray through the Psalms. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but it's a really neat thing to try to pray through uh, the Psalms. It's a great book to, to do that. Psalms were meant to sing and pray, so I uh, uh, challenge you to do that. But um, let me ask you a question. Did you know this? Did you know that getting older has a downside? Some of you may not know that, that getting older does have a downside. These young people have no clue. They will get there one day. Um, yeah, getting older has a downside. And one of the downside is, is that I never can find these. <laughs> Did anybody ever have that problem of finding things, keys, whatever the case may be? I don't know what, what, it, what it is with you. But it seems like that these things grow feet. And everywhere I look... They're always a step ahead of me, hiding in a different location. I could have swore the other day I got up and wanted to, you know, I got up and normally I, uh, I don't have, get up with a, a, a fashion idea, but I got up with an idea that I wanted to wear a certain shirt. And, and I mean, I looked in my closet, it wasn't there. I, mean, I tore things up trying to find my shirt that I really wanted to wear. And I uh, walked in the first thing, and I blamed my wife for taking it. Because she loves to steal clothes out of my closet. But I walked in and I said, where's my shirt? And she said, it's in the closet. No, it's not. And then she gets up, walks straight in there. And then I hear her walking out and going, what's that right there? <laughs> that wasn't the shirt I wanted. Yeah, it is. It was. You ever, you ever felt that way? That you just can't find things that... You know, you're misplacing things and you lose things. Well, it's kind of similar in our Christian life, all right? You see, there was these two boys, 8 and 10. Now, I don't know if you've ever had boys, but 8 and 10 years old. And these boys were mischievous. I'm talking about if there was anything going on in this small town, mom and dad knew that probably those two boys were involved in it somehow. You ever known any boys like that? Have you ever had any boys like that? Just really mischievous. Well, the mama finally went to the dad and said, you know what, I don't know what to do about these boys anymore. And she said, but I do know that the pastor down the street at the church has had tremendous success with disciplining boys and getting them to do what they're supposed to do. Do you think it's time we take, him to, take them to that pastor? Well, the dad said, you know, I don't know if it's right now, if that's what we need to do or not. And then, of course, the next time something happened, the dad walked in and said, you know what, it's about time. I'm about to lose my temper, and I'm about to kill these kids. Let's take them to the pastor. So they took the boys down to the pastor, and the pastor said, you know what, I want to meet with them one at a time, independently. So the first boy walks in, the youngest of the boys walks in. The pastor said, sit down, boy. Kids sat down pastor looked over at him stern look on his face he said boy where's God where is God 
little boy just looked up, didn't answer. Preacher said, well, you know what? I have to up it a little bit. Son, where is God? The little boy was just at this point shaking. Pastor took his finger, put it right in that boy's face. I'm going to ask you again, boy. Where is God? Boy took up out of that chair, out of that room, and he ran home, slammed the door, hid himself in the closet. His older brother walked in. What's wrong? He said, oh, boy, we've done it now. God's missing, and they think we've done it. (laughs) You know, our Christian lives are kind of like that, aren't they? Where God knows where he is, but sometimes we lose God. He doesn't move, but we do. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation before. I have. My own personal spiritual lives. I think we all go through desert times in our lives. Psalm 63. Now this is a story about, I mean, this is a psalm written by David. And listen to what Psalm 63 says. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And the title of the message this morning is simply this, chasing. Chasing. How many of you have ever chased something? I, many of you probably know by now that I have been dead set against having a dog in my house. Well, that didn't last too long. I've got one now. And he's an Australian shepherd. And people have warned me that he is very feisty. And, uh, of course, I didn't think anything about it. I can handle it, right? Yesterday, we were walking out of the door to go to Omega Trail... And as we were walking out the door, Traveler, my dog, takes off. And he takes off and he runs in the yard around and around and around. And have you ever seen four people chase a dog? I mean, I thought about taping a football to his back. He would be the best running back on any team. But, I mean, he was chased, and we chased him, and we tried to trap him in, and it just couldn't, wouldn't work. And I, I got to thinking about this message and how ridiculous I looked out there chasing this dog. And every time he would escape me, I got madder and madder. And then finally, I just said, you know what, dog? You better hope I don't catch you, you know? <laughs> Have you ever chased anything? I don't, care. I don't know what it is, but chasing after something? And, and so I got to looking at these passages of Scripture, and this is exactly, I mean, David here in, in Psalm 63, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8 this morning. And, and I want you to look at it. Now listen to what it says. God, thou art my God, I shall seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh yearns for thee in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have beheld thee in thy sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise thee, so I will bless thee as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember thee on my bed, I immediately I, I, I meditate on thee in the night watches. For thou hast been my help. And in the shadow of thy wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to thee. Thy right hand upholds me. Now, I want to stop right there. Because let me give you a little background on what's going on in the, this 63rd Psalm, as we would see it. David, and if you've got a little um, introduction, uh, a title in, in, your, in your Bible there, it says that this was a psalm written by David in the wilderness. Now, there was two times that David was in the wilderness in his life. Now, a literal wilderness, and I think also figuratively a, a spiritual wilderness as well. But there were two times. One was when David was fleeing from Saul, and the second time was when David was fleeing from Absalom, his son. All right? Now, I got to thinking about it. Which one of these is this? Well, if you look at verse number 11, now listen, look at verse number 11. But the king will rejoice in God. 
All right, so David is the king, so we, we, we can deduce that this is not him fleeing from Saul. So this is the incident probably of him fleeing for his life because his son wanted to kill him. Now, I'm going to tell you, you want to talk about a dysfunctional family. That was one. Hey, by the way, many of us may say that we have a dysfunctional family. Have you read some of the families in the Word of God? Okay, it will make you feel a little bit better about your own family. I mean, we've got jealousy, we've got envy, we've got murder, we've got thieving, we've got all of this stuff. And these were the families, good families, in, in, that we would see and read in the, in the Word of God. So here's a situation that David is in. Now, David is not in this situation because, well, you know, just bad things happen to good people sometimes. Remember after the sin of, with Bathsheba that da David did. And here is what happened. His family fell apart as a result of it. Okay? First of all, we know this. Okay? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Sin can destroy your life. Sin can destroy your family's life. We know that. All right? I'm not going to go into any details of that. But the problem is, and the situation here, is that Absalom, his son, ran David out of Jerusalem. And he is on the run, and he's in the desert, and here he is, life has fallen apart. Let me ask you this, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced this kind of thing in your life? Where all of a sudden, things are going okay, you're rocking along, and then life happens. I mean, out of the blue, maybe. Anybody, anybody ever been broadsided out of the blue by something? Just a, a phone call in the night? Oh, those phone calls. Or uh, somebody comes up, let me just tell you something. Everything's going great. Everything's going fine and dandy. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, life happens. And here David is, not really understanding what's going on, and life happens. And here he is in the wilderness. He is in the desert. And I love what King David says here that it was a dry place. A dry place. And let me ask you this, have you ever been there? When you are there, let me tell you, there are two choices you have. Now, put these down on your message notes, all right? Two choices that you have when you are in the desert, all right? When you are smack dab, face on with life, two things you can do. You can fight, or you can flight. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. You can get bitter at God and say, well, I don't deserve to be here. I can't believe this is happening to me. Woe is me. How many of you have ever been there? We can belly ache and moan. Many of us, we can throw our pity parties with clowns and balloons and the like. And we can invite other people to come to our pity party because you know what? Misery loves company. And we can do that. And a lot of us do. We can get bitter at God and blame Him. Folks, can I tell you bitterness is real? Can I tell you that there are tons of people out there? Can I tell you that there are tons of people in here that at one time or another has gotten bitter at God? and left and fled the presence of God but here's another thing that you can do you can get bitter and leave the presence of God or number two you can chase after God the more all right you see there's the difference in the two and I think everyone would fit into that category today get bitter, get mad at God, and go away, we hide, or we can stand up. I'm going to tell you, right here in these verses of Scripture, you will not find a man who rolled over. You will not find a man who got bitter at God and left the scene and never was heard from again. You find a guy who was chasing after God with everything that he had. Every ounce 
that he had. He chased after God. And now you know why the title of the message is, message is Chasing. Because here's what I want to do this morning. I want to give you three ways to chase God right from these passages of Scripture. All right, you ready for them? You ready for them? Number one, chase after God obsessively. Obsessively. Now, you may be thinking, well, Brother Jason, where is that right there? Look at verse number one. God, thou art my God. I shall seek thee earnestly. Do you see that word earnestly? Now, this even goes further to the obsession of David. Listen, my soul thirsts for thee. Here's another one. My flesh yearns for thee. David was obsessed. Now, I say the word obsession, and some, some, of, you, some of you get the negative idea, okay? We can be obsessed with things, right? We can be obsessed. And I'm going to tell you right now that majority of us, now I'm including us all together, and I'm preaching to me this morning, okay? All of us tend to have our yearnings and our obsessions for things other than God. And when we do that, that's where the problems come in. That's the first step of headed to the desert place. is when we get obsessed with other things. David was obsessed with other things. He allowed things to overshadow God in his life. But here, David is in the desert. And I don't know about you, but I have learned more in my Christian life and in my spiritual life in the desert places than I ever did in the cool places that are just wonderful. How many of you learn more when you're going through a tough time in your life than you do when everything's smooth sailing? You know, everything's smooth sailing, and we just tend to put it on autopilot, I guess you could say. And, and we just tend to cruise. David was right in the middle of a desert place. And look what he does. Look, look at it. Don't, don't miss. If, if you highlight or if you like to underline, or even if you don't want to do it in your Bible, and I can understand that, um, you got some message notes. Write these down. Write these words down on the side there. Uh, my soul thirst. Have anybody ever really was thirsty? Anybody ever really was thirsty? I mean, some of us may feel like it. You know, how many of you have ever said, I, I, I said it yesterday, man, I'm hungry. I am starving to death. death. All right. Have we really? Really? I mean, come on. I, like I said the other day, you know, I look out there and you can look at me. We haven't missed too many meals. All right, we really don't know what starving to death really is. And, and I, thirsty. I mean, have you ever just really been thirsty? And you, you're, you're sitting there going, no, I wasn't until you said that. Now, I, oh, I've got to have something to drink now. Thirsty. Look at what David said. I mean, I want you to see the words that David uses here. All right, these are not just, oh, man, you know what, I'm, I'm thirsty. I could use a drink. Or, you know, the, these are obsessive words, okay? Number one, he's thirsty. His soul is thirsty for God. He has, a, he has a thirst. And it's a thirst, listen to this, that only God can fulfill. David tried to fill that thirst with other things, didn't he? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to fill your thirst with other things? How'd that work out for you? Left you thirsty again. Reminds me of the story of Jesus at the well and he's sitting at the well and I love the I love that passage of scripture that he had to go through Samaria he had to it was a divine appointment here he is sitting on this well and a woman comes there to draw water and she's going to draw water and Jesus says give me a drink and I love to ask people this question why did Jesus ask for a drink because he's thirsty that's why it shows the humanity of Jesus. And he says, give me a drink. And the woman starts talking. Then they began to talk. Isn't it just like Jesus to get a spiritual thing started on water? <laughs> Isn't it great? It just shows me that you can get a spiritual conversation started about anything. 
And Jesus just used water there. And here's what Jesus said. You can drink of that water right there. Now I'm paraphrasing it my own. It's a new Jason version. But he says this. You can drink out of that water right there. But chances are you're going to come back and fill that water bucket up again. And you're going to thirst again. And then he looks at her. Now can't you just see a grin in Jesus' eyes? But the water I'm going to give you, the water I can give you, you'll never thirst again. You see, we have a vacuum. We have a hole that we were born with. Every one of you are. All right? Now, at this point, a lot of people look down and go, I didn't know that. It, 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 you can't see it. But it, it is a hole right here. And only God can fit in there perfectly. But what we do is we try to fill it with other things. And it leaves us empty. It does. Look what David says. I thirst. My soul thirsts for you, God. And then listen to what he says. My flesh yearns for thee. I mean, every part of David's being was dry. And David realized the reason he was dry was because he was without God. Isn't that amazing? We can sometimes misplace God. God doesn't move. We're the ones that move. We're the ones that tend to walk away from Him. Some of you say, well, Brother Jason, I, I, I'm saved, right? No, I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm not, I'm not talking about that at all right now. I'm talking about your relationship. I'm talking about your fellowship with God. Is it where it needs to be? We must chase God obsessively. Now, what do I mean by that? How do I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's how you do it. First of all, you fall in love with His Word. You've got to get in His Word. Take it. From somebody who knows that what you can do is you can try to fill that hole with other things and it'll always leave you empty. Get in His Word. Study His Word. Do you know what this is? This is God's love letter to you. Did you know that? Did you know that you can read this Word and you can study this Word? And I, I just love how people say, well, this right here, was the, the, you can't really apply this and that and this and that. We make this word here more complicated than God intended it to be. Really. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't study. I'm not saying you shouldn't know the context. I, I love, I, yeah, you don't, shouldn't take stuff out of context, that kind of thing. Understand it, study it, know it. But don't make it harder than what it is. It's a love letter. This book has one theme. And you know what that theme is? Salvation. It has one hero. His name is Jesus. It has one villain. His name is the devil. You see, you see it in the light of that. And you read it. And you study it. And you know it. But let me give you another thing too. If you want to chase God obsessively, you got to pray. Get on your knees in prayer. That is the second thing that you'll find that will lead you into the desert is when you fail to pray. I asked my Sunday school class this morning, have you ever walked out of the house and forgot your cell phone? Buddy, raise your hand. I didn't have anybody in my class that ever did that because I think it's permanently attached to us. Walked out of the house the other day, drove down the road, and got all the way to the church, Got out, and all of a sudden, I start doing the pat. You frisk yourself. What I do with it, I start looking around the truck, couldn't find it anywhere. You know what I did? Got in the truck, drove back home, and there was the cell phone right where I'd left it. We, have y'all seen the commercial? I don't know if it's Xfinity or AT&T or whatever the company is, of the family that is disconnected. And they're trying, they're fighting over Wi-Fi coverage. I've got one bar, you know. I don't know if you've seen that commercial. If you hadn't, I mean, it's a really humorous, it's really funny commercial. And the reason why I think it's so funny is because it's so sad. 
that we are so connected today that we are so that way. And I'm not preaching against technology. I'm not doing that this morning. But I'm going to tell you this. If we cared as much about our communication with God as we did with our cell phones and our connectivity to the Internet, we would be far different country. We would be a far different world. We'd be a far different people, wouldn't we? But here's the thing. We don't want to miss that connectivity with somebody else. I am telling you what. Facebook, Instagram, all of those things right there. I mean, instantaneously, we are... Uh, we were talking the other day about why the newspapers are going having so much problems. Well, I'll tell you why the newspapers are having so much problems. Because by the time you get a newspaper, that thing's three days old. All the news in there is old. We're getting stuff right at the minute. If we took serious our communication with God, how different would life be? Chase God obsessively. You know what? Don't let stuff get in the way of your relationship with the Lord. Don't let it. Mom, Dad, don't let it get in the way of your family. Don't let stuff get in the way. Let me give you another one, too. Not only Bible study, not only prayer, but how about this? How about being around people that are chasing God obsessively, too? You ever been around somebody that's just negative? Anybody ever been around that? You ever been around somebody that brightens the room when they leave it? You ever been around somebody like that? They brighten the room when they leave? They're just negative you, you dare not ask them, how are you doing today? Oh, you're just not going to believe this. They've always got some problem. My grandmother, God rest her soul, she was one of those kind of people. My grandmother would call me up, and when she found out that you, she learned how uh, one of her friends, it was just the infancy of, of computers and technology, and and. Somebody gave my grandmother a WebMD book one time. My grandmother, all you had to do was look up the symptom, and you could find out what you had. My grandmother called me on the phone. You're not going to believe this. What? I got such and such. You got such and such? Yeah. Oh, it says that the book says I only got about three months. She always had something wrong with it. I don't know about you, but you be around somebody like that. It's always got something going on. But how about this? Let's put it on the flip side. You ever been around somebody that is just so positive and so encouraging? You ever been around somebody like that? Boy, you just kind of want to be around them. They just fuel. They just kind of add kindling to that fire. Here's the thing. You can withdraw yourself, and what will happen is your fellowship and your fire will cool. I've seen it happen. People, something doesn't happen the way they want at church, and they go. People, don't, something happens, and they, oh, this is, not, this is not the way I want it done, or this is not who I am, and they bolt away from church. Next time, and I told y'all, there's something magical about fire and men, right? Y'all remember that? Yeah, men and fire, we just love it. But I'm going to tell you, the next time that you're... <laughs> don't start a fire now. Uh-uh. 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 Uh -uh. We're too dry to start a fire now. Next time you're starting a fire under better conditions than we have now... <laughs> Look at that red, hot, glowing fire and take a glowing piece of wood off of that fire and see what happens. Just put it aside and see what happens. It will cool to the touch. Yeah, you can just pick it up and touch it. Then put it right back into the fire. And what will happen? It will glow red hot. See, that's the same way it is in our Christian lives. Whether or not you like me, you need me. Whether or not I like you, I need you. 
We must chase God obsessively. I was thinking of another one. Look at, look at, let's just look at the second one here as you go down through there. And it, it's, I, I love verse 2. Can, can't you just see verse 2? Uh, David is, is searching for God, right? He, he's chasing God. And then he says in verse 2, Thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise thee. So I will bless thee as long as I live. Look at verse 5. My soul is satisfied. Now, look at verse 7. For thou hast been my help, and in the shadow of thy wings I will sing for joy. Now, we're starting to see David make a, a transition here. He's chasing God obsessively. But you know what? We as people, we, we, we need to chase God worshipfully. There must be a worship there. You see, in the moments of David's dryness, he is reminded of God's goodness. Did you hear that? In the moments of David's dryness, he is reminded of God's goodness. I remember thy loving kindness. I remember thee. Do you, not, do you see it? Don't miss it. Do you see it? Look at it again. Verse number 2, Thus I have beheld thee in thy sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory. Now David is worshiping God. Do you see that? David is on the run. His son is wanting to kill him. I mean, this has got to be probably the lowest point in his life. He, he, he ran from Saul, but that's different. This is his own son, and his own son wanted him dead. David was not in a happy place. David was not in a joyful place. But listen, David praised God no matter what the circumstance. You see, many of you are like me. I'll praise God when I feel like it. When I feel like it, I'll praise God. Folks, you may not feel like it. You may not be in the mood to praise God. But I want you to hear this. Praise Him anyway. Well, pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right. You don't know what I've been through. You're right. Pastor, I have nothing to praise God for. I've heard that. Stop. And stop. Just sit a while and see what God has done for you. Listen to this. This is an amazing thought. David was in the lowest point of his life. But can I ask you a question? Did it change who God was? God was still God. God was still God. God was still God when David was in the palace. God was still God. When David was in the caves, God was still God. When David was in the desert places. You see, David praised God because God is still God. God will be God yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. You know what I love about God is God doesn't take away his love from us just because we mess it up. Anybody ever messed it up? Or am I just looking at a bunch of folks who never mess up anything? I can, I can, I, I, my, my favorite statement was told to me a long time ago by my pastor, my mentor. He looked at me and said, you could tear up an anvil with a rubber mallet. I can do that. I can tear it up with a feather. I can mess it up. Murphy's Law, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And it can, and it does, and it does to me. And I can do that. So we've all messed up. But let me ask you this. In the times that you messed up, does it change who God is? No, it doesn't. In the times that you really foul it up, does it change who God is? God is still God. Can I tell you this? I love it. Just, just write in the margin right there. And I, I want you to just, just write in the margin verse number two. Verse number two is, to me... My favorite verse in all of Psalm 63. 
Here's what it says. Thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary. You see, David is saying, in the lowest points of my life, I have seen you. Now, don't miss this. To see thy power and thy glory. You see, God is still God, even in the desert. God is still God in the palace. God is still God. And you know what? He's mighty. He's everlasting. He's all-loving. He's all-knowing. Nothing, I don't believe a blade of grass moves out there without God's ordaining it. That, folks, is worthy of praise. I read a, read a book by Barbara Johnson one time, and I don't even know if it was the name of the book or it was, it was an article that she had written. Barbara Johnson, if you ever gra get anything by her, she is great. Woman full of problems in her life. And here's what she said. She said, praise your way to joy. I don't know if that was a title of a I once I was reading it, and it was praise your way to joy. And then in the, in the article, here's what she said. She said, when you don't feel like praising God, do it anyway. When you don't feel like praying, pray anyway. When you don't feel like singing a praise and worship song, sing it anyway. When you, don't feel like, uh, when you don't feel like singing that hymn, sing it anyway. Praise your way to joy. And I love that. Because even in the midst of our desert, he's worthy to be praised. Now, let me give you the last one. Let me give you the last one. And it's found in verse number 8. I love it. Not only do we chase God or should we chase God like David did he was obsessive about it but he was also worshipful about it now I want to see how you kind of land the plane with this one look at verse number eight my soul clings to thee thy right hand upholds me you see we chase God obsessively we chase God worshipfully but there ought to be an expectation when we chase God. We chase God expectantly. Why? What was he saying right there? Listen to what he's saying. It is a prophetic statement. Who is at the right hand of God right now? Jesus Christ. Who is upholding us? The right hand of God. You know what David was expecting? <laughs> David was expecting God to do something. Do you not see it right there? Listen, listen, look at it again. Look at it again. Verse number 8. My soul clings, and then I like this, to thee, thy right hand upholds me. I'm reminded of this right here, and I've been reminded of this for the last two weeks. I don't know why. I don't know why, but this has been on my heart for the last two weeks. I'm going to share it because somebody needs it, I know. I've needed it, but I don't know why. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come so that you may have life to the fullest. Or if you've got a verse of Scripture says to the abundance. You know what that word abundance is? A really neat Greek word. The word abundance means abundance. Overflowing. Isn't that great? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. It's kind of neat to start a message in the book of Psalm and end in the New Testament. Isn't it neat? That's just kind of how the Bible is. Matthew chapter 7, I think Jesus taught more on the expectancy and, and, and expecting things right here. Because here's what I, I honestly, I, I can't prove it. I can't prove it. I'm not smart enough to prove it. I can promise you that. But I just, in my heart, in my soul right here, I believe that David, when he says, talking about God's right hand, I believe that this verse of Scripture was somehow in his mind or in his heart 
The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. It's very prophetic. Listen at Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse number 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you, when his son asks him for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he shall ask for a fish, will not give him a snake? Will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven um, give what is good to those who ask him? All right? What does that have to do with what David chased God? When you chase God obsessively, when you chase God worshipfully, and you chase God expectantly, you will never be disappointed. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open to you. Do you know why many of us are dry and thirsty? Because we choose to be. Hey, I, I'm just here today to tell you this, and this is going to hurt somebody today. This is going to hurt. You got just a, as much God as you want. You want more? Chase after him. I love that verse of scripture that says, draw near unto me and I'll draw near unto you. You know what? Many of us this morning will leave out of these doors and you will leave God when you leave these doors. And you'll come back and pick him up next Sunday. Your life will never be changed. Matt Cicado, one of my favorite authors, Matt Cicado said this, and he said it in his book, Just Like Jesus. It's a great book, easy read, love it. Here's what Matt Cicado said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but here's what he said. He said, Jesus is not a coat to be put on in the morning. Jesus is not a cause to pick it around. He is a lifestyle to be lived. Isn't that neat? He is a lifestyle to be lived. I love that. Jesus is a lifestyle to be lived. Not a coat to put on or shoes or something like that. Let me ask you. Do you want to find God. Do you? Chase after Him. We have an opportunity to lead people and share the message of the gospel with people as they close through, the, walk through the Omega Trail. And all of us counselors have been talking about this one thing. And, and we talked about how great Omega Trail is. And, and I ask them, what is the worst part about Omega Trail? And I am going to tell you by far, 100%, Pansy and Don, the worst thing about Omega Trail is hell. I, I don't know why, but they, 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 they just tend to believe that that's the worst part about hell. But here's what I, here's what I, the worst part about Omega Trail is hell. It is. It's terrible. But here is what the great thing is, is that hell out there, they can leave. The eternal hell they'll never be able to leave. And here's what we do. is we, we share the message of the gospel. We tell them that a sinful person, God can't look upon a sinful person. There's a gap between, and, and good works won't fill it. Religion won't fill it. Philosophy won't fill it. Morality won't fill it. All of these things will not fill that gap. That bridge will not be there. But here's the thing. Jesus Christ died, and that cross fits, that, fits in that gap perfectly. And we can walk right across that cross of Jesus Christ to God. But here's the thing. What is our response to that? Do you know what our response to that is? By faith. That's what people find hard to believe. Is that you can have hope, joy, love, peace, faith, all of these things. And all you have to do is simply believe in it. 
Is that it, Brother Jason? That's it. It's so simple. The gospel is simply glorious, yet gloriously simple. It's so easy. I want you to bow your head with me this morning. Do you know him? Do you know him? I didn't ask if you knew of him. I didn't ask if you knew all the ways to get there. Salvation is not found in a plan. It's found in a man. His name's Jesus. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you chasing God? Or are you chasing the things of this world? It's easy sometimes to let things overshadow God. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that you are always welcome at the summit. We are located on Highway 81 south of Loganville. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. and worship is at 10.30 a.m. For more information, you can visit our website at thesummitchurch.com.